Martinis and cigars are making a comeback. Some car makers hope it's just the beginning. That's this week on Motoring 98. TSN's Motoring 98 is brought to you by Quaker State. The big Q stands for quality, always has, always will, and Midas for new, longer-lasting, performance friction carbon metallic brake pads. You know, golf and cars have a lot in common. First, they're enjoyed by people of all ages. And while joining a prestigious golf club like this one is a sign of success for some people, so is owning a big luxury car, you know, like a Cadillac or a Lincoln. Well, the golf club is still a big deal, but now aging baby boomers are going out and they're buying in record numbers cars like the SLK, the Boxster, and the Z3. I mean, we're talking small here. So what has happened to the big car luxury market. Where is it going? Well, we're here in Homestead, Virginia to check out the 1998 Lincoln Town Car. And we thought while we're here, let's see if we can find some answers. Comfortable and expensive. That's how the Oxford Dictionary defines luxury. And in the good old days, that meant big cars with big price tags. Who would have predicted that someday a truck would also be a sign of affluence? But that's what has happened as a sport utility market has exploded. Luxury car makers didn't miss a beat and began producing big ticket 4x4s. Even stuffy Mercedes-Benz broke down, built the M-Class and can't keep up with the demand. We now take you to Homestead, Virginia where Ford is introducing its new Lincoln Town Car, once a sign of luxury. I say once because its new Lincoln Navigator is the new fashion, while its share of the American luxury car market has plunged from 26% in 1990 to 14%. I think the concept of luxury uh, as we know it today has changed and and I don't have any problem discussing it with them. Most people can articulate what they think luxury should be. Uh, I think the luxury market has certainly expanded. Uh, you're right that the traditional Lincoln Cadillac uh, relationship that most North Americans viewed it as has certainly expanded. And uh, I suppose our best uh, response to that is the expansion in our own product lines, like going into products like Navigator. Uh, the new Continental and, and some of our future products that uh, people will see over the next several years. Our average age right now for Lincoln, this is uh, excluding Navigator, is about 63 years old. For the town car, it's about 67 years old. And that age has crept up over the years. So you're right, the, our customer base in general has become older over time. One of our challenges, again, is to broaden the relevance of our product line so that more people uh, find it attractive. With that in mind, the new town car is not only four inches shorter, but comes with a lot more curves than last year's model. One of the key things we tried to, to improve on the town car was the overall handling of the vehicle, the handling and balance of the vehicle. But one of the criticisms in the past has been that while the ride was very good, uh, the handling was a little bit floaty and a little bit imprecise. So what we've tried to do is retain the great ride while vastly improving the handling. Along with the European luxury cars, the town car's toughest competition is coming from within its own showroom. Lincoln planned to build 18,000 navigators, but bumped it to 30,000 and sold every one. The navigator is a signal of change with the Lincoln brand, and it's uh, by its mere presence and by advertising it and marketing it, we're showing the world that the Lincoln brand has changed and, and can be relevant to more people. It's a subtle approach. We're not going to walk away from our, 
our loyal owner body who we value very much. Uh, and we use the Navigator to attract a lot of buyers that maybe we haven't seen in the past. It's a, it's a unique vehicle and, uh, and it competes very well with the other luxury sport utilities outside of the traditional, I guess if you will, Lincoln Cadillac kind of relationship. Along with a more modern interior and lots of chrome, the town car comes with a base signature series with a V6 and a V8 in the LTS version with 220 horsepower. Now martinis and cigars are making a comeback. Will the town car do the same for the domestic luxury car market? I like to think our trends are a little bit more enduring than uh, the latest fad for cigars and martinis, but one of the taglines uh, that we'll use in some of our ads is uh, the new town car puts an end to this less is more nonsense. So really, I don't think uh, a contemporary luxury car in the 90s has to uh, be excessive, but it, it's a big car. It's got a, a, lots of cargo capacity in the trunk, and I don't think it's something that we or its owners should apologize for. For years, the problem with electric vehicles has been finding a long enough extension cord. Well, here at the Tokyo Motor Show, we've seen the future of the electric car. That's coming up later on Kenzie's Corner. On this edition of Test Drive, we take a look at the world's favourite car. Now, at the launch of this vehicle, you should have heard the oohs and ahs when they lifted the hood. Everybody was admiring the nice, shiny, clean headers. Well, of course, nothing could be further from the truth. These are not the headers. They are, in fact, the four branches of the intake manifold. Now, the reason they're shaped like that is to keep the length between the throttle housing and each of the four intake valves the same. This improves low-end torque. At last, the Corolla has low-end grunt. Despite being a twin-cam 16-valve unit, the new motor delivers in the usable range. Most of the 120 horsepower and 122 pounds-feet of torque produced by this new 1.8-litre unit report to work in a timely fashion. Needless to say, I'm impressed. The engine also benefits from a full bottom-end brace that replaces the usual main-bearing caps. Not only does this stiffen the crankcase, it reduces the level of NVH, particularly in the higher portions of the rev range. Many of the Corolla's immediate competition lack in this particular aspect. As before, there are both manual and automatic transmissions available. The stick shift, while better than some of Toyota's previous front-wheel drive boxes, still exhibits a rather rubbery feel as you run it up and down the gears. Conversely, the auto suffers no such malady. It is smooth, seamless, progressive, and offers a ratio to suit every occasion. All of that explained, I would still take the do-it-yourselfer, primarily because it makes the most of the new engine's power. The general road manners have also taken a turn for the better. The steering response is both positive and quick, the suspension isolates the occupants from the rigors of a rough road, and at long last, the car feels as though it's capable of resisting the urge to keel over mid-corner if you happen to drive it a little enthusiastically all of which means the Corolla drives rather nicely and appreciably better than before. Now this is not an indictment of the previous car, rather it's a sign of just how good $15,000 cars are becoming. If you go with the base VE Corolla, do yourself a favor and take the touring package as well. This thing brings larger 185 65 14 tires to the party and they make a huge difference to the car's capability. The package also includes a spoiler I could live without, a truly funky set of white-faced analog instruments and a CD player instead of a cassette. On the subject of the CD, I get taken to task a lot by my peers because I suggest it should be given the place of prominence. They, for some reason, like the climate controls above the radio, saying that they adjust them on a routine and regular basis. Well, all I can put that down to is they must have a weaker constitution than I do. Just kidding, Jerry. <laughs> Usually when I get into the back seat of a small car, I have to slouch to find enough headroom. Not so in the Corolla. Not only is there a ton of legroom, there's more than ample headroom. Now compared to the rest of its compact competition, the Corolla is almost limo-like. 
Elsewhere, the seats are form-fitting and provide better than average comfort. The trunk is well-shaped and gives you access to 12 cubic feet of usable space. And on the safety front, you get dual airbags, adjustable upper seat belt anchors and child-proof rear door locks. The disc drum setup hauls the Corolla to rest in just 118 feet. The pedal is easily modulated and a full anti-lock system is an available option. Even before the revisions to this vehicle, you know, the Corolla, the world's favourite car, had durability, reliability and resale value on its side. With a better engine, a better suspension and a stiffer body, well, I think it's got it made in the shade. Would I buy one? You better believe it. The car is a 1974 Volkswagen VW thing, and it's uh, called a Type 181. It was built in Mexico and imported into the U.S. for two years, based on a German military vehicle, and it's a uh, rear engine, rear wheel drive. It's the type of car that my mother doesn't like. It's too windy. It's too noisy. It's uh, We've actually considered getting uh, headphones for the drive. It can be very loud in the inside. It's a fairly quiet Volkswagen sound. It's very distinctive. Um, visually, it's very distinctive. If you see that drive by, you'll know that that's not a common car. The, the thing I love most about the car is probably its uniqueness, the fact that it's fun. Uh, kids kids will look at, watch it go by on the street, and they'll be like, D look at the big toy, I can drive that. And uh, that's that's fun, the sense of fun that you get, and, and the fact that it's a convertible, there's, a, there's an enjoyment factor that I get out of driving the car around. With the windshield down, it's like, it's almost like boating. Our Midas tip of the week concerns valve stems. Every tubeless tire has what we refer to as a snap-in valve stem that pulls through the rim and snaps securely into place before the tire is mounted. Here's a few things you should know about these stems. They come in different lengths and you should carefully select the proper length so that it projects through your wheel disc or trim ring without sticking out so far as to get crunched on a curb. Secondly, they should be replaced every time the tire is worn out or serviced. If you've got a mysterious leak that you can't track down or a rim leak on an aluminum wheel, I strongly suggest that you replace the valve as well. Another tip, before you check or adjust the tire pressure, purge a little bit of air through the valve to clean any dirt out of the tip of the valve before you install your gauge. Some cars come equipped with valve extensions. There's one right there. They're a convenience feature in that you don't have to remove a cap in order to check or adjust the tire pressure, but they're a big liability in the winter time. They tend to stick and freeze the valve by allowing moisture into the valve core. I strongly suggest that if your car has these, you think about replacing the, the entire valve assembly with the correct length of valve and get rid of this extension. They work well in warm, dry climates, but they're a big liability in Canada. That's your Midas tip of the week. A portion of Motoring 98 is brought to you by the Solder Seal Gunk family of automotive products, makers of Puncture Seal Gold and Liquid Wrench. When you bring it into the water, you put it in uh, low gear, that is the gear that moves the wheels, and you also put the gear on that turns the props, the two propellers at the back. And you bring it into the water with both the wheels turning and the propellers, and uh, you drive in until the propellers take over when you're, it, it floats, it uh, just floats off. It's registered as a car and a boat. So if you see the numbers on the side, those are the numbers uh, that, that all boats must bear. So when you're in the water, you're a boat. That's right. And now, of course, you have to comply with all the boating regulations, and you have to be equipped to be a boat. Part of that equipment is uh, life jackets, one for every uh, person in the boat, which we have. Paddles. I have paddles under the front seat. I have everything that you're required to have in a boat. How fast can it go? I guess I should say, how fast can it go in water and on land? Well, uh, I think uh, about 10 knots on the water and on land. Um, Oh, 50, 55 miles an hour. Why don't you think we see more amphi cars in the water? Well, uh, there's there's not very many of them left uh, because, after all, you know, they stopped making them over 20 years ago, and that's quite a uh, quite a time for a car to last. 
but the few that are left are in the hands of collectors, and uh, I guess they hang on to them. You're not going to sell yours, are you? Not a chance. Not a chance. They haven't printed that much money yet. While Ford has improved the styling and handling on the 98 Lincoln Town Car, I do have one pet peeve, and that is with the trunk. In one word, it's awkward, and you'll have to be creative when putting luggage or golf clubs in it, thanks to the obtrusive spare donut tire. All right, it's now time to head to the garage and join Bill Gardner. You know, Bill, like the rest of us, will someday become a senior citizen and look forward to owning that dream car. I wonder what Bill will be driving, a Mercedes, a Lincoln, Cadillac, BMW? How about it, Bill? Well, Brad, as nice as some of today's luxury cars are, personally, they're just not my cup of tea. I can't foresee myself ever buying one. And if there's anything other than dynamite that could get me out from behind the wheel of that pickup truck, it'd probably still be something that was a little bit truck-like. I'm thinking in terms of a half-ton two-wheel drive Chevy Suburban. That would be my ultimate luxury car, so to speak. In any case, the component that I want to talk about in this week's show is a component that's common to any kind of car, sport utility, or pickup truck. No matter what your motor vehicle is, it's got at least two or three of these babies. And I'm talking about an engine mount, or as some people refer to them, motor mount. Now, it's the job of the engine mounts to uh, support the weight of the engine and transmission, to position them, but most importantly, to isolate the noise, vibration, and harshness that's produced under normal operating circumstances, to isolate that from the cab or chassis of the vehicle, so that in the passenger compartment, you don't feel that harshness or noise coming back in there. And when this part fails, that's one of the symptoms that you'll get. On this particular car, we've got the cylinder head removed to do a head gasket job. And while it's off, it affords us a real good look at, at the engine mount. That's it right at the back of the engine. Uh, it supports and carries the weight of the engine. And on this particular four-cylinder Cavalier, that's the engine mount that typically fails and causes a lot of vibration and harshness to come into the passenger compartment. The configuration and location of the engine mounts will vary considerably depending on the type of vehicle you're talking about. But suffice it to say that you've usually got an engine mount on either side of the engine and then a similar kind of a mount back on the transmission to locate and position it as well. Now, there's a motor mount that we just took out of a late model Cavalier the other day. And this thing doesn't look broken or separated, but believe me, this, this mount was transferring a lot of engine vibes back into the passenger compartment. Now, there's the metal core in the center that's bolted to the engine. There's two bolts go right through those holes and into the engine block. And those two studs sit on a, a saddle on the frame and this metal perimeter is, is then connected to the frame. But the two are completely isolated by this rubber. This is all rubber right here and all the way around there. And that rubber isolates the engine vibes from transmitting through there. Now there's not a whole lot of maintenance or service that you'd ever do to these other than replacing them when they fail. But there is one type of driving that if you can avoid it, well, you may uh, lengthen the life of these to the stage where you never, ever have to replace them. And believe me, a lot of vehicles go to the wreckers with the original mounts in them if they've been driven carefully. And that uh, thing that I'm talking about is jackrabbit starts. If you're in the habit of putting that vehicle into driver or reverse and really giving it a sharp jab on the throttle when you move away, well, that's, a, that's something that's definitely going to fatigue these more quickly. And people that uh, routinely drive their vehicle in that fashion are probably going to change these things maybe a couple of times before they scrap that vehicle. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 98. Our Midas tip of the week con concerns getting better performance. Still going? Our Midas tip of the week. Uh, no, I get another. Nobody is going to buy the Toyota Prius for its looks. This thing is ugly. But the significance of this car is that it will be the first production vehicle with a hybrid powertrain. 
It has an electric motor, which can drive the car from the blue battery pack. That will give us zero emissions performance in the city. Out in the country, it can run on and the gasoline motor, at the same time, it can recharge the battery. Now, for a long time, we felt that the hybrid concept is going to be the only practical way to get the low emissions performance of an electric with the range and performance of a gasoline engine. But here at the Tokyo Motor Show, we found out that's not the case. Because as you can clearly read here, or maybe you can't, Honda has developed a gasoline engine with virtually zero emissions. The key to this engine is the fact that most pollution is caused in the first minute and a half after a cold start. Honda has added another catalytic converter here to trap those pollutants. Then when the engine's fully warmed, it draws those pollutants back into the engine, burns them more completely, and the final cleanup is done by the conventional catalytic converter. Honda demonstrated this by sticking an exhaust gas analyzer in the tailpipe, read it virtually zero hydrocarbon emissions. They pulled the sensor out, and the emissions went up by a factor of four. In other words, the exhaust coming out of this engine is cleaner than the air that goes into it. You can't buy this engine today, but in three or four years' time, something like this will be powering your Honda Accord. It's not an entirely new concept. Saab's been talking about this for a couple of years, and Mercedes-Benz is this close to announcing their own system. But what this engine will do is give virtually the emission-free performance of an electric without the cost, complexity, and range problems of electric propulsion. Not only does it kill the hybrid concept, it drives the final nail into the coffin of the electric car, and not a moment too soon. I'm Jim Kenzie. For over 20 years, arriving in a Lincoln Town Car has meant something special. These words were spoken by Jim O'Connor, Ford's Vice President in charge of Lincoln. But as we have seen, Ford can't keep up with the demand on their new Lincoln Navigator. This is the new status symbol. So can Ford now convince people that the Town Car is still something special? Well, only time will tell. That's it for now. We'll see you next week as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. A demolition driver has to have, uh, well, crazy isn't a good word. You just, no fear. You got to have no fear hitting hard. You'll see drivers out there today that'll play the game and toy. And then you'll see drivers that'll play hard. Uh, if all goes right, the hard driver will win. TSN's Motoring 98 has been brought to you by Quaker State. The big Q stands for quality, always has, always will. And Midas, for new, longer-lasting, performance-friction carbon metallic brake pads.